three and I was gonna say I'm sure the recording is going and we make you. So welcome everybody. It's uh, as always um, amazing to see your lovely faces. I've missed you. It's been a week. Um, so welcome to Bible study <clears throat> and how dramatically the world can change in just a few days. So we're going to open in prayer and um, we'll ask someone to pray shortly. Um, let's remember, obviously, our study. We'll remember the people of Ukraine. And let's remember especially Brother George and Sister Naz <clears throat> that they may experience a healing touch today. <clears throat> Sister Louise, could we please ask you to pray for us, my dear? Certainly. Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that we are um, part of your family, and thank you that we have a Sabbath time in which to fellowship, especially with you, Lord. We look forward to this time that we're able to delve into your word, and we pray your wisdom over each of us um, as we listen and contemplate what is being shared this afternoon. We think of um, our friends over in your Ukraine and ask your watch care over them that they be aware of that as well, Lord. Um, please be very near to them and please um, put your healing hand on George and Nez um, so that they may be restored to full strength and health and strength and thank you Father for your love we praise you in Jesus name Amen Amen Amen, Amen. Okay so last week we did uh, Leviticus it was pretty exciting learning all those chapters and then we looked at the pattern in the book of Leviticus. And after the class finished, Venice ran up and said, what happened to the quiz? And I said, oh no, I totally forgot about the quiz. I had prepared a quiz for you. Um, so now we're gonna have to do a quiz. <laughs> um, but I'm gonna do a two minute recap, okay? We'll do a two minute recap, unless one of you brave souls wanna tell me the 27 chapters. Um, Thea smiling, I'll make a deal with you. I'll put up the photos, okay? And you can sort of tell me what's in each photo. How's that? Sound all right? Okay. Well, let me just go slide share. We're just gonna quickly go through these um, chapters and then I can do the quiz, uh, which, will be, which will be exciting. Okay, so we'll bring up my screen. Yeah, I, I love the um, chapters. That's um, really awesome knowing those and you use them all over with your Bible study. Okay. Um, right, Thea's going to have a go. So we're in the book of Leviticus and we're going to run quickly through these chapters. Yeah, you, there you are. Good offering. Grain offering or meal offering, peace offering, sin offering, another sin offering, guilt offering, trespass offering, um, Aaron and his sons being consecrated into the priesthood. Right. Um, the priesthood ministry starting. Wonderful. Um, yeah, 10 degree burn from Nadab and Abai, is it Abai do? Abai? Correct. Correct. Um, unclean, the clean and unclean animals. And then we have the story of the 12 year old mother um, being pregnant and having two sons with leprosy, 13 and 14. And then another son that has sanitation obsession. Right. Um, and a baby being born in the Day of Atonement. And another child that likes to give blood. And 18 and 19 um, like being in relationships. Um, and another child that's been put into prison. Um, 21 and 22 um, are 
sons that had been gone into priesthood, that had turned into priests. Um, the whole family come into a feast except number 20. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then they all have, they go into a party and blasphemy and, mm -hmm. and then the mother is happy because she doesn't um, give birth anymore. Right. It's like a jubilee year. Awesome. Um, then the mother comes and um, she wants to talk to the children and talk, wants to talk about the blessings and the cursing. And um, 27, they all agree to do, uh, they all vow to um, follow God again, I think. Yeah. Wasn't that wonderful? That's amazing. So, yeah, just that storyline mm -hmm. is so great. It goes from 12 to 27, and you've got all those chapters memorized. So, we're going to do a quiz. And look, I've, I've chosen some photos for you to try and jog your memory about these chapters. Now with some of these photos, there's going to be overlap. So there might be two answers or three answers. That's okay. Just tell me what comes into your mind. Okay, we'll just get started with a gentle one. So here's picture. What chapter comes into your mind? One. Yes. Yes, burnt offering, I can see that. Anything else? Sin. Sin offering, yes, I can see that too. Chapter eight. Oh, not eight, sorry. Um, the Day of Atonement, maybe. The Day of Atonement, absolutely. Yep. That's when the priest lays hands on the uh, scapegoat. Okay. Anything else? What about um, chapter seven, trespasses pass? Trespass offering, yes. Yeah, so I started you off on this one because there's multiple offerings that could apply to this, but you could also apply chapter 25 to it. So remember 25 was the Jubilee year and in the Jubilee they had to do the sacrifice as well. So. There's multiple applications here, but that's just to get you started. Now, let's see what you think about this one. Venus, you know this? Ten. Excellent. This is Nadab and Abidu with their profane fire. All right, someone had to have a go at this. Eleven. Excellent. Clean and unclean animals or foods. Very good. 13 and 14. 13, 14. Excellent. Leprosy. Jubilee. Yeah. Chapter 25. Correct. 25. Excellent. Oh, actually, I just thought about something. Um, yeah. Half of 50 is 25. So if you forget which chapter Jubilee oh, yeah. is, just do that. Okay, yeah. what about this one? Um, number one? Yes, definitely. The burn offering. Could it be number 15, chapter 15? 15 is sanitation. Know. Were you thinking of something to do with sanitation? Oh, I might have got this chapters wrong. Okay. I was thinking of the atonement. Um, 16. Yeah, but there isn't this, um, see the scapegoat is not tied up like this. The scapegoat sent out into the wilderness. You put your hands on the goat and you send it out. This is this lamb is tied up. This is going to be a well, the perfect sacrifice. So this is either going to be a burnt offering, or I'm wanting you to like to look at this picture and immediately think Passover. This is the Passover lamb. So if you think Passover, which chapter do you go to? Where's the Passover? Venus, you know this one? 
Passover. In other words, I'm saying, where's the feast? Oh, that's um, 20, <laughs> 23. Excellent. Yeah. So in 23, you've got all your feasts, feasts right? You've got Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, etc. So all the feasts are there. So that was a tricky one. How about this one? Number nine, chapter nine. Yep, it could be uh, chapter nine, but it could also be chapter eight. Eight. Eight, yeah. eight is, yep, yeah, that's right, consecration, anointing. That's what's going on there. And then they begin their ministry in nine. Excellent. How about this one? That burnt offering. Yes, it can definitely be chapter one or sorry. They have a time at 16. Definitely, definitely. So you know how when they finish laying hands, they bring the goat out to let it go. So it could be on the way out. But once again, I'm wanting you to see the fire, see the lamb tied up, and we thinking. Passover. Passover, correct. Three. Once again, yeah. It could definitely could be one, the band offering, or 23. Excellent. 12. Okay, we're going to mute you now, Venus. Too many answers. <laughs> okay, uh, 12, that's laws of motherhood. Excellent. This one. Um. Is that priesthood ministries number nine? It definitely could be. Yep, absolutely. Where is he here, though? And absolutely. Because remember, Lindsay, he goes into the most holy once a year. Yes. It, um, it's more Day of Atonement. And on the Day of Atonement, remember, he uh, has to have that smoke covering the cherubim okay that's how it's described so i'll put that picture in intentional so that's oh. chapter 16 how about this one 24. <laughs> i'm busy lip reading here venus's lips excellent this is a guy uh blaspheming so that's chapter 24 excellent how about this one Priesthood, 21. Uh, absolutely, correct. 21 or 22 is correct. And also? Chapter 9. 8 or 9, correct. So those are the four chapters to do with Aaron and the priests. 8 or 9, 21 or 22. And then I think this is the last one. Yep. Take your time. This is a tricky one. Hmm. Any thoughts? Brother Terence. Thinking of 26 and 27. Uh, 26, 27. Sorry, Naz, what did you say? I'm thinking of the feast. Thinking of the feast. Um, I don't know which chapters, but yeah, because of the thoughts, maybe. I don't know. Right. Um, and the tithe. Tithe, yeah. No, I'm just having problems tying up the fruit with the feast. Um, you may be right there, but Lindsay, you're spot on. So this is this verse is from chapter 27. So this is under the chapter of the vows. This is where it's declared that a tithe of everything belongs to the Lord. Excellent. So you survived the quiz. That's great. Now, 
I'm going to do something interesting with you today because we are going to go into a new room. So you know how we have our photo theology palace and we have multiple rooms in there. Uh, this is a room I haven't mentioned to you before. It's called the chain reaction room. Mm. And essentially, um, let me just see for a second. Yeah. So essentially, um, the, the, the name of the room is what it is. Here we're going to see chain reactions. Okay. So let me just start very gently to introduce you to this concept. Now, this is a very commonly known chain reaction. It's called the domino effect, right? I love watching those videos where these guys set it for a kilometer and you watch all these chain reactions. Fascinating, really nice. So that's well known. And then this of course is a nuclear chain reaction, right? So this is where the uranium nucleus is split into two fission fragments. You've got all these neutrons. And obviously this is the basis of the uh, atomic or nuclear, nuclear bombs. So there's a chain reaction as well. I like this one. Um, here the fire is gonna spread from one to the other, but notice that there has to be a substrate. There has to be something for the fire to burn. And without that ignition, that material, which makes it ready for the fire, the fire is not going to spread. And I kind of see this, you know, spiritually with us as well, like with Revelation, with Jesus saying, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Uh, I see that door as being a fireproof door, like all good buildings should have, right? Not let the fire through the door. But if you open that door, which Jesus can't do because it's your choice, then it allows the fire of the Holy Spirit through into your heart. So I do like this one. Okay, so uh, let's leave it on that for a second while I just make a few comments. In, if we take this chain reaction principle into our Bible study, I think of it as basically a whirlwind, whirlwind tour. Because when you go into the chain reaction room, you've got no idea where the next thought is going to lead you to, all right? It's quite random and it goes in different directions. So one thought will connect with another thought, with another, and there's no pattern. So that's important to remember. Because if one dot led to another dot, led to another dot, and you saw a pattern, then you're operating in the patterns room. But if here, if one dot led to another and you just can't see a pattern, then you're in the chain reaction room, okay? Pattern, remember, is where, like you look at the story of the life of David and you see a pattern and then you find a parallel. So every pattern in the Bible has to have a parallel, either with Jesus or with end time events, or something else that you can prove publicly. If you've got a storyline that's got no parallel, that's not a pattern. That's just a chain reaction. Okay, so um, the, the next comparison is if you're joining thoughts or dots and you're extracting spiritual lessons from that, well, I already taught you that room and that room was called the freestyle room where you just took an object, you took an experience, you brainstormed, you came up with thoughts and you extracted spiritual lessons. So this room is quite close to the freestyling room and to the patterns room, but in the chain reaction room, it's like that nuclear explosion. The thoughts go in all directions and sometimes they don't link with each other at all. We're gonna do some examples shortly chain reaction room. I do like this room. This room, even though it sounds like it's disordered, uh, there's multiple things going on, but it's not random. Okay, so there is order in this room. 
and there is a thread that joins the thoughts together, but there are numerous tangents, and here, here's the thing, numerous dead ends. Whereas with a pattern, you have a starting point and a finishing point. Here, you'll, you'll trace a thought, you'll come to a dead, dead end, and then you'll trace another thought. Um, a good starting point for a chain reaction is to decipher or to interpret the verse that you're looking at. So if you're looking at a verse, you cannot get a chain reaction from that verse unless you unpack that verse, okay? You've got to know what that verse in front of you is saying, so you've got to unlock all the words, and then you'll see the sparks fly. Okay, so let's say, for example, you go to your desk, and you sit down for Bible study, okay? Any day of the week. And you're about to open your Bible and your wife or your husband or your flatmate or your parent or whatever the case may be, shouts out to you and says, um, don't forget that Peter, the electrician, will be here at 11 o'clock to fix the lights. All right, Peter, the electrician, you just hear it and you reply, okay, you're about to start Bible study and this message has come into your mind. And you start thinking, oh, Peter, the electrician, is coming at 11. I remember Peter in the Bible. Um, he was that apostle. He was a fisherman. Um, but you know what? He actually was a spiritual electrician because he was the one who preached that, that, that sermon and 3,000 people were baptized. Mm. Uh, he walked with the Son of Man. He walked with the Son of God. In fact, he walked very closely with him. Um, the Bible says that there were three disciples which were very close to Jesus. There was uh, Peter, James, and John in Mark 5, 37. And Peter was one of those. Ah, so he was one of three that walked very closely with Jesus. And, you know, in the Gospels, um, we see that he was quite impetuous. Uh, he's always speaking his mind. And he's acting on impulse. Uh, in fact, in the book of Acts, Peter is transformed from someone who's quite impetuous into someone who now they can rely on. The new church constantly turns to him and looks to him. And I do remember he walked on water. You know, the other disciples sat back and they just watched the miracle unfold. Whereas he became part of the miracle because of his boldness, okay? Now, you're sitting here at your desk and all these random thoughts are going through your head. You haven't even opened your Bible. And this is all stemming from the fact that Peter, the electrician, is coming at 11 o'clock, okay? So that's kind of how this goes. So I'm just seeing who's in class. So happy Sabbath to everyone who's just joined. Um, now let's go, go on. Peter was the one who confessed Jesus as Messiah. Now Peter actually wasn't the first disciple to recognize Jesus as Messiah, but he was the first one to say it to Jesus's face. Yeah. In fact, the first one who recognized Jesus as Messiah was Andrew. That was Peter's brother, because he had heard it from John the Baptist in John 1.34, and then he said it to Peter in John 1.41. He said, we have found the Messiah. Come see. But then later on, Peter says it to Jesus, to his face. He says, you are the Messiah. Um, so we see all these amazing things about Peter. We see that he was one of three who walked very closely with God. But then some sadness falls over you because, alas, you remember that Peter denied Jesus. 
not once, not twice, but three times. Okay. Peter denied Jesus three times. In Mark 14, 30, it says, Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you that today, even this night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. Now, I do like Mark's version because Matthew, Luke, and John says the rooster crowed, just crowed, which means once, or they don't specify. But Mark specifies twice. And there is some evidence to suggest that Mark or John Mark may have actually written the gospel experience of Peter because he was Peter's traveling partner. So Mark, the story of Mark could actually be Peter's gospel written by Mark. And that makes sense because Peter was uneducated. He never went to school. He couldn't write. So he needed someone to write for him. In fact, 1 Peter, 2 Peter says that he used Silas to be his scribe. So we know those letters were written by someone else. He, he did the dictation. So it kind of makes sense that he probably told Mark everything that went on and Mark would have written it down. So that is one popular held, held uh, belief. And then in Mark 14, 72, it reads, a second time the rooster crowed. Then Peter called to mind the word that Jesus had said to him, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And when he thought about it, he wept. And so my mind starts to think, he denied Jesus three times, yet he was one of three people that was so close to Jesus. I wonder if there's something in Peter and the number three. Well, let's find out. So you open your Bible and you think, is Peter associated with anything else that involves three? And you'll give me a couple of answers shortly, but here's the first one that comes to mind. Peter goes up to the roof to pray, but he was hungry as well. And so he has a vision on this roof of sheet filled with animals, unclean animals. And Acts chapter 10, verse 11 reads, and he saw heaven open and an object like a great sheet bound at four corners descending to him and let down to earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth and creeping things and birds of the air. And in verse 15, and a voice said to him a second time, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. This was done three times, and the object was taken up to heaven again. So this vision was given to Peter three times. Well, that's interesting, right? So here's a man who denied Jesus three times, is given this vision three times, and straight after the vision, he um, hears a knock on the door, he goes down, and there stands three men from Cornelius. Cornelius had sent him, the Holy Spirit had, had, had engineered this. And so Peter goes down and lets them in and obviously visits Cornelius and you know the rest of that story. But there is one classic uh, 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 example that follows. Now, remember when Peter denied Jesus three times, that was Peter disowning Christ. Now, Peter needed to be reinstated by Christ. When did that happen? When Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? Excellent. Fantastic. That's John chapter 21. Jesus reinstates Peter by asking him to feed his sheep. And he asks him to do it three times. Do you love me, Peter? Yes, Lord, I do. Three times to confess his love, to make up for three times of denying him. Okay. So I'm at this point now where Peter, the electrician, has led me 
very strongly into these correlations with the Apostle Peter and the number three. And now I'm thinking, oh, I remember that lesson um, this guy did in photo theology. I can't remember his name. Oh, yeah, I think it's Dr. Stan. He did this um, room called the symbols room, and he was describing all these different numbers. He, des he described the symbolic significance. I wonder if there's more in the number three, and there must be, because the number three appears in the Bible 467 times. In fact, the only number that appears more is the number seven. The number seven is God's perfect number, and it, uh, it appears 735 times in the Bible. But the number three means harmony, and it means new life. It means completeness. And yeah, I would love to see what other applications or themes are used for this number. So let me have a look at this. Oh, this was um, Jesus asking Peter, do you love me and feed my sheep? So we are going to have a look at um, the number three quite briefly. Now, here's your first heading. There are places in the Bible where God says something three times, okay? God says something three times. Uh, for example, um, God calls the prophet Samuel three times. That was in 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 8. We just saw how Jesus, who is God, asked Peter to feed his sheep three times. But then, of course, the classic example is this. This is when Jesus is in Gethsemane and he prays three times. Matthew 26, verse 44, it says, So he left them, went away, and again prayed the third time, saying the same words. Okay? So there was beauty even in that prayer before his final trial and tribulation. So that completeness, that, that, that harmony is there in Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. Then there's this category, category of three words, the same words being repeated three times. So the first category was God saying something three times. Then there's a category of three words repeated. Okay. So one example is, Whoa, whoa, whoa. The three woes of Revelation. This is where the angel is foreshadowing the terrible judgment in Revelation 8, verse 13. And then I like this example Jeremiah 22. Oh, earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Now I'll tell you shortly why the Hebrew repeats the word three times and why there's this emphasis and why it's three times okay and then of course you know the classic one in isaiah 6 verse 3 which is and one cried to another and said holy 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 is the lord of hosts the whole earth is full of his glory right so three words being repeated third category is the third day. Obviously, we can't talk about the number three without mentioning how Jesus rose on the third day. Uh, Corinthians talks about it. First Corinthians 15 verse four, it says, and he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, right? So, so we, we know we can find it in the gospels. But even Paul has got a record of this. And, you know, this is important also, like I mentioned uh, in the resurrection study. In Jewish culture, culture, three days past the time of death indicated that they were truly dead. Putrefaction was starting to begin. And therefore, Jesus truly conquered death by not rising until the third day. And which is the reason why he waited till day four to raise Lazarus as well. Then we've got 
the three patriarchs, um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These were the fathers of the Israelite nation, God's people, once again, this complete circle, God's people, symbolized by three patriarchs. And obviously from Jacob, you get the 12 sons. Three prayers. Pastor Clifton mentioned this in his sermon this morning about praying morning, noon, and evening. Three prayers. You know, we believe the early Christians um, had three set prayer times during the day because there are, for example, two places classically talk about it. One is Psalms 55 verse 17. It says, evening and morning and at noon, I will pray and cry out aloud and he shall hear my voice. And then, of course, you all know the story on your screen. Daniel, where he goes up to his upper room, opens the window and prays towards Jerusalem um, morning, evening and noon. What about this? Those three wise men brought three gifts to the baby Jesus. But look at the significance, because the gold signified Jesus' kingship. Uh, it was a gift for a king. The frankincense was his role as high priest and mediator. So this was a gift fit for a priest. And the myrrh is the anointing oil for Jesus' great sacrifice for us. So even in those three gifts, we saw the roles of Jesus that he was going to play uh, as savior. And then of course, we've got close to our hearts, three angels messages, uh, which I won't go into. We know those well. We have to touch on the Trinity. Uh, God the Father is clearly described in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6. It says, yet for us, there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ. Then with um, uh, God the Son, Colossians 2, verse 9, reads, for in him, <clears throat> meaning Jesus, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So God the Father, God the Holy Spirit becomes the bodily uh, manifestation through Jesus Christ. And then the Holy Spirit is uh, 2 Corinthians 3 verse 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And then there's famous verses like Matthew 28, verse 19, go forth, baptize, make disciples in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. So um, this is a clear principle of um, the Trinity and the Godhead. So as I have gone off as, at these different tangents, triggered off by Peter, the electrician, I'm pondering the number three, and I think, Actually, I remember a place in Revelation where one of these principles apply. Wasn't the number, wasn't the number six repeated three times in the book of Revelation? I remember there was six, six, six. So this number six was repeated three times. And I wonder if these principles I've just learned now from my study of three could help me see this a bit more clearly. Okay, so I know that six is the number of a man. That's man's number, okay? In Hebrew, there isn't what we call in English comparative or superlative. For example, in English, we say good, better, best. In Hebrew, they say good, 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 good. Okay. Super important principle. So, for example, in Isaiah 6, where Isaiah is hearing the angel say, holy, 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 what he really is hearing the, hearing the angel say is that God is holiest of all. 
So that principle <clears throat> works with numbers as well. So six is the number for humanity, a man's number. <clears throat> and this opponent, this 666 person is a man because we told that it's, it's the number of a man. So he is a six, which is a man. No, hang on. He is a six, six, the most a man can give. No, no, no. He is a six, 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 the very biggest that man can be and stretch to. But here's the good news. The good news is this enemy, this opponent to God, his number might be 666, but he will never be a seven. There is only one seven, and that is God. So this enemy is still only human. His symbolic number is 666. He is the worst. Here's the principle. He is the worst that humanity can be. He tries all that he can in his human powers. He will use deceit. He will use false religion. He will use political power. But he will never get beyond six because there's only one seven. And that's the Lord. And he is reigning in heaven. Okay. So what I've done is we know what the numbers mean when you take, you know, uh, vicarious fillet die, etc. But I've taken this principle of 666 being repeated three times uh, and explain to you how it expounds this Hebrew principle. Now, I want to take that principle <clears throat> and see if we can explain 144,000. This will be fascinating if we can. So the first thing with 144,000 is that the Bible says here are 144,000. It doesn't say it, here is the 144,000, okay? So it's just described as 144,000, not the 144,000. So this number appears twice in Revelation, and it's a combination of numbers. So this, again, is how Jewish numerology used to work so you, how can you break up 144,000 right simplest way is in 12s and 10s 12 times 12 and then you got the 10s now the number 12 symbolizes we have to go right back to the 12 tribes it symbolizes the people of god okay in other words, all of God's people, the 12 tribes were not 12,000 per tribe back then. They were all of God's people, okay? So 12 times 12, remember 12 means God's people. 12 times 12, in other words, I'm repeating 12 twice, means definitely all God's people. You remember how we had holy, holy, holy? Right, so... 12 is God's people, 12 times 12 is most definitely all of God's people. Then we're going to look at 1,000. This is 10 times 10 times 10. So remember your decimal system. 10 is a complete number. 10 is complete. 10, 10 is very complete. 10, 10, 10 is absolutely complete times all the people of God. Okay, we've got 12 times 12, absolutely all the people of God. 10 times 10 times 10, absolutely complete all the people of God. So when John sees 144,000, if you apply the principle of this numerology, what God, what John is seeing is absolutely all of the people of God are kept safe during these onslaughts of the enemy, not just at the end, but throughout human history, not one of them is missing. So that's the message. 144,000 is the whole of God's people 
is kept safe. Not one of them is lost, not one is missing. Now this is real hope. This is the great multitude. What's being revealed here in Revelation is hope. The Revelation is a book of hope and not of fear. Remember that song? I'm no longer a slave of fear. I'm a child of God. There's other proof. There's other proof for the fact that the 144,000 refers to the great multitude. It's like when John heard and then he turned to see and what he heard and what he saw was different. So there's other proof, but I want to just show you with that principle of three repeated, how we could come right down to, to having another means of explaining that the 144,000 uh, is all of God's people. Look, at the end of the day, this is not a salvation issue. If it is a literal number, then fine. It's a literal number plus a great multitude, okay? All of God's people would say. If it's not a literal number and it applies to all of God's people, great. It is the great multitude that the great harvest is going to occur for. So either way, but we do have more proof for proving that the 144,000 is not a literal number. Uh, and, and I've got three reasons. This is one of them. Excellent. So as you can see, this principle of the chain reaction room, you've got no idea where you're going to end up. Yeah. All we know is that we started with Peter, the electrician, and here I am talking about the 144,000. How did we get here? That's the key. We don't know. You cannot trace your steps in the chain reaction room. And that's the beauty of it. Uh, just go off because when you're studying and you pray before you study, the Holy Spirit will guide you. And every tangent you go at is a gem. That's how we find some of the stuff that I, I teach you in phototheology. We just randomly, well, not that randomly, but we led to it by the Holy Spirit. And you, you pick it and you run with it and suddenly you see a pattern. Nobody ever starts off seeing a pattern. You always in the chain reaction room. And only when you're connecting the dots, then you say, ah, there's actually a pattern here. Let's take it out of that room into the patterns room. And now we find a parallel with it. So I'm gonna give you a classic example of the chain reaction room, and that's the sower and the seed. So all of you have read that. Welcome back, Brother Terence. Did you fall out of class? Uh, yeah, I think it was something to do with my Wi-Fi. Just for a couple of seconds, I was out and I was back in. Welcome back. So we're going to start um, the sower and the seed now. So go to your Bibles and, um, yeah, hold on to your seats, like I quite often say. So we're in Matthew chapter 13. And we're going to look at some of these. I'm not going to read it because you've all read it, but we're going to look at some of these verses and pick out some key points so that we can um, make some sense of it. So while you get there, I'm just going to go to share screen. Excellent, so let's get rid of this. There you go. My favorite thing, a blank screen. So we're going to populate the screen as we go along. So when you get there, you, you see in Matthew chapter 13 that Jesus went out of the house and he sat by the sea and a great multitude were gathered together to him so that he got into a boat and sat and the whole multitude stood on the shore. 
and he started teaching them in parables. Behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside. So we're just going to read that, and we're going to start putting some pictures and other bits of information on this uh, blank screen. So what we've got here, this brown indicates soil. So that's, you know, good soil. But next to the soil is the wayside. So that's the pathway, if you like. So that's where the red stuff is. There's no soil there. It's like a tarmac. Nothing grows on that. So that's your, your wayside. And that's verse 4. If you didn't jump to verse five, it says, some fell on stony places, okay, where they did not have much earth. So with your stony place, there is some earth, there is some soil, but there's not much. So you've got more stones than earth. That's your second drawing. If you jump now to verse seven, it says some fell among thorns. So that's your third ground. You do have soil in this ground. Otherwise, nothing will grow. But thorns grow as well. And then in verse 8, the last seed falls onto good ground. Okay, so I'm just going to have to move your lovely faces so I can see my screen. There we go. So... Um, Let's review that. So we've got the wayside, we've got the stony ground, we've got the thorny ground, and we've got the good soil. Okay. Now, when the seed falls on those different places, different things happen. Okay. Now, if we go back to verse four, it says there, it fell on the wayside and the birds came and devoured them, okay? So we are told literally what happens to the seed, that the birds, birds came and devoured it. And then it says in verse five, when it fell on the stony places, they immediately sprang up uh, because they, sorry, some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched and they withered away. So we are told that they burned by the sun. This is because they have no root. And that fits in nicely with the fact that there's very little soil. So remember, your soil as you're going through is progressing. On the wayside, there's no soil. Stony, there's little soil. Thorny, there's more soil. And in good soil, there's great amount of soil. So with the stony, there's very little soil, so the roots go shallow. So when the sun burns, they wither. Now with your thorny ground, you get down to verse 7. It says the thorns sprang up and choked them. So they were choked by the thorns. This is what's literally happening in, in this so far. Last of all, in the good ground, um, it heals a crop. So this is good soil, good ground. And then from verses 10 to 17, Jesus explains in principle form why he's teaching in parables, okay? So we don't have to go into that in today's study. But this parable that's on your screen, the disciples didn't quite understand it. So Jesus had to give them a spiritual application or explanation for it. And that starts in verse 18. So in verse 18, he says, therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches it away. So wayside hearing implies no understanding. Okay, that's what Jesus is saying. What's going on here in this field is a lack or no understanding. Then we jump to the stony one, which is in verse 20. But he who receives the seed on stony places, this is he who receives uh, the word immediately and receives it with joy. Okay. 
So received with joy, but no root. Verse 21 says, yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. So that's what's going on in Stony, fitting in literally with the fact that there's little soil, so the roots are shallow, there's excitement to receive it, but there's no root, okay? Then on the thorny ground, Jesus says, he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. So he receives the word, but he's choked by the cares of the world or the word is choked by the cares of the world in him. Very good. So we're putting down the spiritual application for what happened literally at the top. And with the last soil, uh, Jesus said, on the good ground, it is he who hears the word and understands it. And then, of course, um, goes on to bear fruit. <coughs> so with the good soil, hears and understands. Okay, so that should be pretty clear so far. We've got all these different grounds and soils. We see what literally happens to it with the burns, the sunburn, the, ch the thorns, and then the growth, and underneath it, the spiritual application. But Jesus goes one step further, and he says that when there's no understanding, it's actually Satan who snatches it, right? So that's in verse 19. He says, the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. Okay, and with the next one, he says that in verse 21, for when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Okay, so once again, the whole theme of stumbling fits in with the fact that the roots are not strong. It's almost like the plants are tumbling or being blown away. So tribulation, persecution can also be tied in with the sunburn because the sunburn is like fiery trials. So when they come along, they're stumbling. Okay, what does Jesus go on to say about thorny ground? He says they are unfruitful. Um, in verse 22, and he becomes unfruitful when they choked by the cares of the world. And then lastly, the commendation for the good ground, um, it, they bear fruit and some produce a hundredfold, some 60 and some 30. So that's where Jesus has taken um, at the next step. And essentially you've got two points above the drawing and two points below the drawing. So when at the top it says birds devour it, it's like birds are snatching it. You've got the explanation at the bottom for who that bird is, right? Revelation clearly talks about the, the demonic birds in Revelation chapter 18. So when it talks about sunburn at the top, burning the word, at the bottom it's explained as tribulation because these are fiery trials, persecution. And then you've got the choking by the thorns at the top and you've got the unfruitfulness at the bottom and the same with fruitfulness and, and good soil. So there's some good extrapolations that it, when you lay it out like this. So where are we now? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, excellent. Now, before I go any further with the chain reactions in this situation, can you just cast your eyes on what, what's on your screen now? and let your mind go loose. Just tell me if there's anything else you see, any other dots you can connect with this, any other themes, and remember in the chain reaction room, there's no wrong answers. We don't have to prove it, it just needs to be some correlation that you can make. Uh, and we had a lot of fun with this exercise in our masterclass, so let's spend a few minutes seeing what else you can come up with, because I've got some other exciting uh, chain reactions to share with you in this room. Okay. 
The sower goes into all different domains. Sowers and wayside, the same you go, the tea you go, and the good soil. Yep, all different domains. Yep. Absolutely. Any other thoughts? Welcome, Brother John. Hi, Stan. How are you? I've been here a while. Yeah, I'm going to say now. It's, um, it's all you get in the farmer's field, isn't it? You yes. get all the lot, you know? Yeah. 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 Let, let your mind go beyond these fields now. Just think about the Bible in general. Are you seeing anything else in the Bible in here? Anyone? What about um, the tears and the wheat growing up together? Yes, fantastic. Where, where are you seeing that particularly? What, you mean on this picture or in the Bible? Yeah, in this picture. Well, it definitely wouldn't apply to Wayside or to Stony, right? So I would probably say... Yeah. Um, so basically, tears are usually sown on thorny ground. And that's where they start to grow. And that's the stage when Jesus says, don't pluck them up. Because mm. you may pluck the wheat out. Because when they're on thorny ground, you can't actually tell the difference between the thorns and uh, the tears and the wheat. Let them grow. When they get to the good ground stage, now we can tell the difference between them. Now you pluck out the tears, bundle them up, burn them, and then you, you harvest the wheat. So fantastic correlation. Yep. Anything else? Dave said it's all the same seed. Absolutely. All the same seed. The word of God is the word of God. Fantastic. Great point. Um, I now see the reason why Jesus, God said that I will take away the stony part from you. Because when the stones are taken out, these plants will grow. Beautiful. Beautiful. I will give you a heart of flesh. That's good soil. Beautiful. Um, when the, the, I'm not so sure about the wayside, but I'm going to um, be very loose with this, where Jesus first began his ministry um, and people didn't understand what he was doing. Then they tried to stone him. He ended up with a crown of thorns. And then he, after his resurrection and return to heaven, he has produced um, good soil in us, his people. And we hear and understand because of his Holy Spirit. Wow. That is amazing. Um, I have never come across that in our masterclass or anywhere else. So I think you're a photo theologist now. I really oh. like that. Really like that. That's, that's just beautiful. Yeah. I'm going to add it to my notes. Any other thoughts? That's the beauty of the chain reaction room. Just find a trigger spot and let your mind go. I like everything everyone said so far. Makes total sense. Now, can you see, um, I'm going to start you off, if you like, on a weak one. We'll get to some stronger ones shortly. Just start you off on a weak one. Um, can you see the three temptations of Jesus in the first three grounds? Obviously, temptations are sin, so we're not going to associate that with the good ground because the good ground is ready for the harvest. Can you see the three temptations in the first three soils? Turn the stones into bread. Turn the stones into bread. Yes. Anything else? Mm. 
the Lord will send this angel and the wash your feet on the stone. Sorry, sister, say that again. The Lord will send his angels and they will hold you so that you don't dash your feet on the stones. On the stones, yes. Yep. We're going with the stone theme. Yep. Great. So we've, we've seen two temptations now associated with the stones. The bread and throw yourself off, off a high place. Any other thoughts? Here's what we went with in our class. So you see where on the wayside, it says the birds devoured it. Um, and look, it's, it's, you know, like I said, it's, it's, a weak, it's a weak example. It's not a strong application. Where the birds devoured, it basically means the birds are eating. And eating, as you know, is to do with appetite. And so we linked that one in would turn the stones to bread, okay? So it's to do with bread and with food and with eating, etc. So there you got your, your first temptation, turn the stones to bread. And then with your last temptation, where you took him to a high place, showed him all the cities of the world and said, bow down to me, I will give you all of this. Uh, Satan basically showed him the world, the world, you know, the, the, the place where there's full of cares, and concern. So the cares of the world fell in with that temptation. So the middle one we had to tie up now with the temptation of throw yourself off from a high place and the angels will protect your feet. We, we tied that up with this temptation revolving around pride. If Jesus was prideful, he would have done that. He would have said, yes, I'm confident this will happen. Uh, in other words, he's going to be showing off to Satan, but that was Satan's trap to make him do that. So Jesus would have fallen into pride if he had done that. And we see that pride under the persecution and the tribulation and the stumbling. It's not a strong correlation, but that's how we explain that off. But if you take it one step further, all right, so now we've got the three temptations in order. We can take it one step further and tie in 1 John 2 verse 16. So this is the verse which says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of this world. We can now see lust of the flesh, tying in with appetite, which is your first one. We can see pride of life, tying in with the pride of the stony ground, which is the second temptation. And we can see lust of the eyes, which is looking at all the things in the world and behold, I will give it to you, tying in with the third temptation. So we were able to extrapolate and somehow fit the temptations into these, into these fields and also fit in that famous verse into these fields. Not in a very strong way, I will admit. But here come some better examples. Now what you're seeing on your screen, okay? Literally, God is the sower. Okay. God is the sower. John 15 verse 1 tells us that because it says there, I am the true vine. Jesus is saying, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. In other words, God is sowing the seed, which is Jesus. Galatians 3.16 tells us that Jesus is the seed where it says, now to Abraham and his seed, where the promise is made, not his seeds, his seed, referring to Jesus, where the promise is made. Um, yeah, it goes on to say, it does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. That's Galatians 3.16. So we've established that God is sowing Christ. 
Christ is the seed from, from Galatians. And he's sowing it into the hearts of man. The hearts of man is the ground. So the, Jesus, who is the word, who is also the seed, is being sown into the hearts of man. The birds, the birds represent Satan. Revelation 18, verse 2. The birds come along, snatches it away. Demonic influences take, seek to take the word out of your heart. Okay? And those hated birds, the cage for every unclean and hated bird is described in Revelation 18. So that's what you're literally seeing. You're seeing God the sower sowing Jesus into the hearts of man and Satan hovering. But, but man, where the seed is sown, will progress through the different fields. The aim is to get you to the right-hand side of the screen, to the good soil, the good ground. But you could say, hang on a second, I've studied the dimensions room. So if that's literally what it's saying, I could say in the Christ dimension, second dimension, Christ is the sower. And that's fine. Christ is the sower. He is sowing the gospel into the hearts of men, the word. He is making disciples of them, and he is preparing them through the fields to get to the harvest. But hang on. The third dimension says that I could do this as well. Absolutely. I sow the gospel truth by shining my light and sharing my testimony. And I'll come to witnessing in a second because I want to talk to witnessing specifically with regards to these fields. The church dimension, yes, the church is the sower. The church sows Christ in the world. And the same sequence of events happens. In heaven, the harvest of the good ground is taken to heaven. And guess what? There's no more sowing in heaven. There's just growing. Now, these different grounds, I want you to look at it as two different things. Number one, as different states of the heart. And number two, as different battlegrounds. Let me explain. Let's look at states of the heart first. Let's say these were man and his state of heart, okay? How many of us have experiences, who have had experiences, with the different types of soil shown here in our own life, right? Who would say that there was a time in your life where you did not have understanding? In other words, you would hear or read the word and Satan would just take it away, take away the understanding. The reason we know for sure that this is true is that no one is born converted. We have to grow in Christ, and we all start somewhere along the spectrum. Now, that's state of hearts where we have to grow. But if you, if you consider these fields are battlefields, it's a similar theme, but let's say we're doing battle on these grounds. We know that a harvest is occurring in the good soil, and that's what, that's what Revelation 14 Verse 14 to 16 tells us. So we look at, we, we've seen these grounds representing the condition of the heart. Now we want to see each heart represents a battlefield. So here's the thing. We all begin as wayside hearers. In other words, all of us have started out at some stage without understanding whether you were born in a Christian home and they taught you or whether you never knew any of this and you came to the truth. So we all start up as wayside hearers. What does the Bible say about those who then live godly, right? So the moment you're a wayside hearer, you hear something, it gets snatched away, but then you're progressing just a little bit and you're holding on to something. The Bible says, um, they who live godly lives will suffer persecution. 
So every one of us has to go through that second ground. In other words, the sun, the Bible says this, the sun will come up on all, the just and the unjust. Yeah. Now this moving through these fields, these battlefields is the process of sanctification. This is the process of transition through the different grounds. You get to the good ground. Are there tears on the good, good ground? Yeah, we just discussed it. Jesus says, don't cut down the tears till they are growing. And we can clearly see the difference between the wheat and the tears. And then harvesting can begin. So in essence, this parable reveals God's love for humanity, for mankind. It reveals the different stages of the human heart and how God continues to work with and battle for human souls. And it ends with the great harvest of the first fruits of this earth. Now, typically, we look at this parable and we think of these as different types of people. Okay? We think of the ones that are saved are the good ground, and the ones that are lost are the, are the wayside hearers. No. No one starts off as good ground. None of us can say that I was good ground, and that's why the seed flourished in my heart. God has to move us from being wayside hearers, keep us through the stony ground, keep us through the thorny ground, and that's how we get to be good ground hearers. That's my testament. I'm sure it's many people's testament. Remember that the good ground is still a battlefield. 1 Peter 5, 8 tells us that be sober, be vigilant. Because the adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. I like this verse in Proverbs. Guard the avenues of the heart, for it is the wellspring of life. So even when you're progressing through there, and you feel you're on good ground, guard your heart, guard your mind, be sober, be vigilant. It is a battlefield. Till probation ends, it's a battlefield. So bottom line is we still have a battle because we are still on earth. Now, Adventist kids are interesting. So they born and raised in the truth. But even they have to have a conversion experience. Everyone has to have that conversion experience for themselves. That is what changes the game for you as an individual. So this helps us when we meet people. And if we know which battleground they are on, just by talking to them, we can adjust our strategy for witnessing. So for wayside hearers, we can talk to them in a certain way and, and so on and so forth. So that is definitely a strategy for witnessing. But remember that one can also move backwards as well. For example, an Adventist who leaves the faith and, and, and joins a different faith. An Adventist who has become a Presbyterian has moved from good ground to thorny ground or stony ground. Or an Adventist who has become an, an atheist has moved from good ground to wayside hearing. So they regress to where they have lost an understanding of the word of God. It's still happening. I'm not going to mention names, but just a month ago, one of our Adventist pastors has come out and says he no more accepts spirit of prophecy. And he's left the church, man of God. So it's still happening. Moving backwards through these battlefields. 
Now, when it comes to witnessing, just a couple of words on witnessing before we get, go back to the slideshow. As we spread the gospel, we need to be aware that very seldom does the seed fall on good soil. Very, very few people are good soil just waiting for the seed to be planted. Most of the time, we sow and it will fall on either the wayside, the stony, or the thorny ground. If we know this, then we can acknowledge the battle that is required to progress them to the good soil. You see, Satan knows that the seed is most vulnerable before it takes root. And that's when the attacks and the distractions are strong. Because once spiritual roots start to grow, we become stronger. We are now members of the body of Christ. He is the vine and we become the branches and we therefore bear fruit. But remember also that the good soil is not completely free of birds and stones and thorns. When the green grass and the plants are growing well in the good soil, there will still be the occasional bird that flies over and tries to yank out a young plant. Or a stone that will roll in the way. Or a thorn that will grow and need plucking out. That is the reality of being holy in a sinful world. Okay. Now let's go back to the slideshow. We'll continue with letting our minds go loose. Look at the very top of your screen and you should see the word creation comes up. Now, I've got four components here and I've got seven days of creation. Can you see creation in any of these days? Anyone? The second day creation of the sun. I'm sorry, sorry, Irene. We're going to come back to you a second. Uh, Naz, tell me again. Naz, Irene. Sorry, I'm I'm seeing, I'm seeing the sun. Perfect. You're seeing the sun, so you're seeing day four. That's really good. Any other thoughts? Yes, Irene. Sorry, um, you're muted. Sorry, Dave said the first one is kind of shapeless and not not of any good, really. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Um, the wayside is an abyss. Okay, all right. We'll see if we're going to run with that thought. Like day one. Mm. Any other thoughts? The last one mm -hmm. is where God looked at everything he had made and said it was very good. Yeah, that's also a fantastic thought. Now, look at this. For example, I've put there number two right at the top. So on day two, uh, God separated the waters above from the waters below. We know that nothing can grow on good soil without water. In other words, good ground can also be called watered ground. Okay, so we're going to run with day two for the good ground, because that's where we have living waters coming through. Now, working backwards, we should have next day three. And the application there is on day three, for the first time we saw land, we saw dry ground. And as we know, on dry ground, things grow. But plant, uh, sorry, thorns grow as well. They didn't grow on day three, they grew later when man sinned, but that's where on the land you can get good plants and thorny plants. 
day two, of course, we're looking at things growing, but, but we're saying they can't grow without living water. Day four, like Nez said, is about the sun, moon, and stars. So that will apply there. Day five, um, David, rather than the abyss and it being a desolate place, we're going to run with the fact that the birds devour the seed and the birds were created on day five. So you see how the chain reaction work, the room works? It's quite random connections. And, and, and everything you said is correct. I could have put that up as an interpretation, but you, you, you can't just explain one. So if you, if you say day one is wayside, then we've got to have some sort of um, way to follow with the other days. So we're going with two, three, four, and five in that order. But remember everything that's happening at the top, it's being explained at the bottom, remember? So when Jesus said the birds devoured at the bottom, that devouring was Satan. Sunburn at the top, tribulation at the bottom. So let's take those days of creation now and bring it to the bottom and ask the question, what if that day did not exist, right? So I'm saying at the bottom now, what if there was no day two? Ah, so if there's no day two, there's no water to grow fruit. And so fruit will not be grown. If there's no day three, once again, there is no fruit. Unfruitful, no fruit. Day three is when fruit was created on the land with vegetation. So now literally if there's no day three, there's no fruit. In the first one, if there was no water, there'd be no growth of fruit. If there was no day four, this is interesting. It means there's no sun, moon and stars. And if there's no sun, moon and stars, there's darkness. And if there's darkness, you stumble and fall because you need light to walk. So the stumbling fits in nicely with darkness. That's what happens if there's no day four. And if there's no, not no day five, but if there's no five days so far, because everything that was created so far, whether it's the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and the land, etc., was all then given to man to have dominion over. So if there's no day five, there's nothing to for him to have dominion over. So that was just a nice way to, in a very um, random way, introduce creation into this pattern. Okay. Now, what about, what about, and this came up when we studied the book of Revelation. What about the seals of Revelation? We've got four grounds here, and we know that the seals have four horses got the white horse, the red horse, the black horse, and the pale horse. We also know that those four horses parallel the first four churches of Revelation. I wonder if we can see that here. Obviously, we've got good ground to start with. Everyone's going to say that is clearly the white horse, right? So let's run with that theme. The good ground is the white horse. Why? Because the rider on the good horse is on the white horse is going forth to conquer. Um, so the, the equivalent church of that is the church of Ephesus. They were on fire for Christ. So this sounds like the good ground where things are being prepared for the harvest. Church is growing, the gospel is spreading, and the harvest is being prepared. Um, where can you see red, black, and pale? I think the red one should be on the third one. Um, just looking at the ones to chalk, um, chalk people and maybe make them bleed and, you know, the redness and persecution, whatever. Just... Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
uh, yeah, persecution is there on the fourth, my dear. So you want to run with the red horse with the persecution? Yeah. So you remember with the red horse, which equates to the second church, the church of Smyrna, where there was a smear campaign. This is when there's fiery arrows being shot at them. That is the time of persecution, right? So the red horse is here in that column with the stony ground, because that's when there is persecution and it fits in really nicely with right at the fat at the top where it says sunburn. Because remember I said to you, sunburn was fiery trials that come along. And that's exactly what the church of um, Smyrna experienced. And because of all that persecution, they started compromising, which led them to the church of Pergamos, which is equivalent with the black horse. So that's where we're going to put the black horse, because that choking and the cares of the world is about compromising. They were now choking the word of God, but more interested in things of the world. That's where they were compromising. And then, of course, nothing much grows on the wayside. So that symbolizes death. And you know that the pale horse uh, symbolizes death and is paralleled with the fourth church, which is Thyatira, which is the dead church. Thereafter, you get um, um, the Reformation beginning. So ESP, TSB, L. Radio. So we're almost done, almost finished. I just want to show you one other beautiful thing on the screen. The great controversy between Satan and Jesus is on your screen. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Try to flick off a notice and here we go. So the great controversy is on your screen. Um, God is the sower and he sent his son who was the seed, but the Jews rejected him. In other words, they waysided him. And when the Jews waysided Jesus, that can essentially be summarized in the 70 week prophecy. So I've just put the 70 week up there next to Wayside. So the 70 week prophecy, as you know, is in Daniel chapter nine. And we told there in verse 24 that 70 weeks were determined for your people to finish the transgression, to make an end of the sin, to sins, etc. They didn't do this. And so at the end of the 70, um, weeks, which is 490 years, they were cut off after they stoned Stephen. So the 70 week prophecy is here in your wayside hearers, because that's what they did. They rejected Jesus. The seed, the seed of Jesus didn't grow in them. They didn't accept him as Messiah. We get to the next ground, and it's classically described by tribulation and persecution. And nothing better personifies what's going on here than the dark ages. So that is your 1260 years. That's the time of persecution and trials. Uh, and as you know, that's a, a very important part of the great controversy. That's when Satan really tried to snuff out the church of God. Okay. The third ground is the cares of the world. Or we can put it this way. It's a lukewarm condition. It's having one foot in the door and one foot out the door. In other words, there's no great interest in Bible or God. And what is the condition 
of the Church of Laodicea. They are lukewarm, right? Now, Laodicea is the church that's associated with the 2300-year prophecy, because that's the church according to Daniel chapter 8, where the sanctuary is cleansed, and that's when um, our movement begins, 1844 rich and increased in goods and in need of nothing. In other words, the cares and riches of the world become more important. So we're now seeing the three main prophecies, the 490, Daniel chapter seven, the 1260, sorry, the 490, Daniel chapter nine, the 1260, Daniel seven, 2300 Daniel 8 through these fields okay we're left with one ground having come through the great controversy we know how the story ends it ends with the great multitude being harvested so the fourth ground is Jesus coming to harvest at the end of time so when you look at this parable, um, what you see is the great controversy all the way from his first coming, which is 70 week, that's when he came to the Jews, all the way through to his second coming. And God will do everything he can to move people from the wayside to being part of the great harvest. The rest is our choice to make. Now, this is the typical slide that needs to result after you go into the chain reaction room. It needs to be messy because remember, it's a nuclear explosion. So you take a parable, you take a story, or you take a text through the chain reaction room, and this is what happens. Excellent. And that, dear people, is all I have for you today. So let's have a bit of discussion before we uh, close in prayer. That was mind blowing. Thank you, Dr. Stan. Chain reaction room. Any thoughts? You like this room? On the number number three. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there's three times in the Bible it says not to change, not to alter, alter, alter God's word. Deuteronomy 4, verse 2, Proverbs 36, verse. 30 verse 6. In Revelation 22 verse 18 and 19. This is the beginning, the middle, and the end. It says, Don't three. change my word three times. The beginning of the Bible, the middle, and the end. That is just beautiful. Amazing. I like that. Yep, God, God words, God's word never changes. Any other thoughts? So remember, everything we did today started with Peter the electrician. And that's how it should be. Just explosive, nuclear reaction. This is the type of nuclear reaction I like. So yeah, Bible study needs to be, it's holy ground but it needs to be fun as well. You need to enjoy it. Okay. Right, any other thoughts? Um, Theo's very um, quiet. I was going to say that there are many gems that you can glean mm. without even being aware of it. Just one little verse or one little thing. You're mm. right, it just ricochets all over the place. Mm -hmm. Just powerful. Mm. 
And, and the, thing, the thing that Ivor keeps telling us, it's a process where we train our minds to think like this. Because most of us, me, before phototheology, will read something in the literal sense and in the me sense, and that's it. We hardly extrapolate or look for patterns or, or look for chain reactions at all. But these are tools that once you do a few examples, your mind starts to do it even without thinking. And that's, that's the training process, just getting your brain to think like this. Okay. Um. Yeah, I was going to say, um, yeah, the training part definitely would, for me, just personally, um, I would definitely need a lot more time in this room as I think, you know, with all the different things happening around and just trying to get my head around it. Um, yeah, but it was really interesting to see um, just one thing that I took out of it was it's very, um, in terms of, you know, the different places where God sows the seeds or where we sow the seeds, it's very counterintuitive to someone who does gardening because, you know, I love gardening and we wouldn't just be, we'd just go straight and you know, try straight to go into the good soil and not go into, you know, the wayside or somewhere where we know it's not a good place um, or that will grow a ton of weeds or that's very stony. Um, but it just see like, I just saw it as a reflection of, um, you know, God not being selfish or me not being selfish mm. um, in that aspect. Because, yeah, like, you know, gardener, like, yep, straight into good soil, nowhere else. And that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that's a selfish mentality. It's just where you know where the best fruit's going to go. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing was um, that I picked up was, you know, Satan's going to be attacking um, us even more. Like when you talked about the birds, um, like the birds will come more or the mm -hmm. when there's more fruit available and i just see that satan like when we more fruitful when we you know it, it, it's him like you know i need to bring her down even more type of thing mm. um so yeah really interesting room um and i think i don't know it's just the whole orderly thing in my head that i need to yes. you know, just let loose a bit um but yeah. obviously not do this i don't yeah. know just yeah. that part of me, <laughs> yeah. if that makes sense. That makes total sense. Thank you so much for those comments. Just beautiful comments. Um, look, I agree yeah. totally with everything you said. But yeah, we all have a control freak inside of us. Uh, we want order. And yeah, obviously, <laughs> you know, I'm totally like that. Um, but I do like this room because whatever results from this room, I can take each of those points and go and do an orderly study of it. Uh, so it's it's basically giving your mind freedom. So you know, try it. It 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 it's it really works. With your point about how gardeners sow in good ground, yeah. You know the the amazing thing about that is when we witness to people, we can't see what ground they are because it's in the heart, right? Yeah. Totally. So everyone we treat as one of the four, we just witness to them and don't actually know. So you don't actually know what ground they are till you see what fruit they're bearing. Either no fruit, which is no interest, or some fruit, but there's withdrawal or hold back. Then you kind of gauge where they are. So um, yeah, it's interesting. You know, the gut, the heart is not open for all to see. Sorry, Lindsay, you were going to say? Oh, just basically what um, Thea um, brought up at the end about being orderly. Um, yeah, because as you know, I love the patterns room. So everything's a pattern and I'm yep. a very orderly person. So yeah, I I, um, I have to spend more time here, but um, I think it's good for an orderly person to actually go into a bit of a chaotic 
um, place because we're not all orderly people. And in that, um, you can learn a lot from people. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, what I'm learning to do in my own personal journey with um, people is um, actually God has brought me a, I think I may have shared it with you. Um, she's in her 91st year who lives here in the village. And she lives a very unorderly life. Her home is, um, you know, it's, you know, she'll put something down and leave it there and then another pile will come on top of it, that type of um, living. Um, but God is showing me that, um, you know, from that point of view that it's not about that at all. It's about the heart of the person. And um, mm -hmm. so without going off on a tangent, why I really enjoyed um, thinking of my dear friend um, in the sorrow and the seed. I can see now here which soil um, that she is, you know, showing, um, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. helps me then mm -hmm. to um, understand her better. Mm -hmm. I think this is really helpful mm -hmm. so that, um, yeah, you can um, work with that forward. Um, and, and be aware of where Satan is wanting to devour and stop moving forward. So I found that really helpful, really, really good, really good example. Thank you. Loved it. Absolutely. Excellent. Any other thoughts? How's. Um... Well, uh, I think all the soil, I think all of them are workable, aren't they, with time? You know, it's. I think, yeah, it just takes effort, doesn't it, you know? Absolutely. I mean, like, like one belief is that everyone starts off on the first soil. I was interested with that, Stan. Yeah, mm. I, I, yeah I thought that was a good point. Um, which is basically no soil. Wayside hearing means no soil. Yeah. Just no understanding. Uh, how do you get from there to having a little bit of soil? Well, that's the Holy Spirit. Yeah, know? yeah. You mentioned about Adventist kids. Um, yeah. So where do they fall? I found that quite interesting. Yeah, so that was a point that um, Ivor brought up. So here's the thing. Um, you could be in a lovely Adventist home, which is teaching you all the truth, and you could be either stony ground or thorny ground. I don't think when you're surrounded by all of this good ground that you're gonna be a wayside hero. There's gonna be some understanding, okay? But if a child um, reaches a point where they study and they accept and they they ready for baptism etc then they probably at that stage where they on the good ground yeah but i think that doesn't happen passively or automatically so that is definitely a process and we know with with growing up there's different stages of of rebellion and uh, distraction etc etc bottom line is Bottom line, no matter what you expose to, you need your own conversion experience. That is critical for a meaningful relationship with Christ. So you don't get there on the back of what your parents were, what they taught. So um, yeah, uh, it's, it's definitely you know being aware that you could be right in that environment. You could be in church, but you could be on one of the other grounds. Definitely, Stan. Yeah. Um, I was going to say that this is the parable of a sower. It's not a parable of a gardener who would then do what Thea is talking about, where you go and you nurture and you tend and you water, which is where people and relationships come in, um, and the Holy Spirit's guidance and Bible study. It's this parable is really just about having something and chucking it out, whereas yeah. for it to grow you usually grow when you have a relationship, don't you? Very good point. But obviously, as um, you know, children of God and going about and doing his work, we have to be sowers 
and the very next day we have to be gardeners. So I do believe we have to do both. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Some really good discussion there. Um, How's, how's our sick couple feeling? Are you guys uh, refreshed by the word of God? Mm. Yeah, um, as, as people were talking just the last minute, I'm thinking of a book in Isaiah. I don't know which one. I'm trying mm. to think so. That is talking about God uh, restoring Israel. When mm. not not really actually restoring Israel when he's asking them what have I not done uh, to you then he was okay. saying that he watered the land mm. he removes the stone he removed the stone then I'm looking at it was maybe a bare a hard ground he watered mm. it to make it soft mm -hmm. then mm. moved the stones and planted the vine vine tree mm. but it did not produce. It produced wild vines. Then I'm like, mm -hmm. oh. absolutely. That's a process of preparing those types of fires. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. That, that's there's another example of the chain reaction. A beautiful story in Isaiah. God mourning over his vineyard. What more could I have done for you, O Jerusalem? And this is the fruit you <laughs> get. So, yep, we could definitely go and look at that story more closely and try and tie it up. So, yep, um, try, try it, Lindsay. I, I think, you know, going off at random thoughts can be very rewarding. In a spiritual sense, we don't want chain reaction with your work <laughs> or with your life. We need order. But in a, in a biblical spiritual sense, because the Bible is so full of hidden gems, we have to go off in these tangents to to find them it's like the uh the pearl of great treasure yep you gotta get dive to the bottom to find that pearl yeah um i think um i really wanted to just um add on to what uh, sister louisa said like the parable they saw they saw uh, i look at it you know um as uh and an encouragement to the sower that despite what happens with the word of God that we preach, our our goal should be just to present God's word, present Jesus. You will meet people who um, may not show any interest, but go on anyway. You may find places where you can actually identify tares and, and, and weeds. Don't worry about plucking them. You keep on sowing. You'll meet places where there are stones, you know, um, just uh, keep focused on your uh, your goal, which is sowing the, the 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 seed of truth. Because mm, it's it's impossible for us to know uh, what what sort of hearts we are we are we are preaching to at mm. times. Actually, most of the times, mm. yeah. So if we we if you 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 meet a disorderly person or you meet an organized person, uh, your mission is to sow. The, the 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 seed of the truth without being distracted by you know their state or something like that. I just, I'm going, I just, I've just had a thought here that that really is it about isn't it about producing fruit, Jesus? Where where you where you fall, you know what I mean? I mean it, it seems a lot that's left to chance here, doesn't it? Mm. The stony ground, the the yeah, the, the good soil produce good fruit. Is it about the producing fruit, really? Mm. Or, or what? Am I wrong here? Or um, Obviously, the fruit is a product of the type of soil. Yeah, uh, I mean, everyone's, everyone's a lot's wrong. left to chance, isn't it, there, with the where you fall in life, really? So it comes down to choice. And I like to change the word chance when we're talking about spiritual, yes, sir. <laughs> when yeah. talking about spiritual things. Mm -hmm. I like to think about chance as being the work of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Now, the Spirit can work depending on people's choices. And that's, yes. that's the bottom line. So you can progress from a stony ground, 
to a thorny ground. Remember, the thorny ground is better than stony ground because yeah. you've got good plants growing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You can you can progress from there to good ground if you are more open to what you do have growing in you, and that openness is what the Holy Spirit can work with, because God, the Holy Spirit, will not force you. He will urge you. Yeah. Prompt you. He will drop the right verses and right words in your day, but you have to be open to it. And when you are, then the spirit can work with you. So that's 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 what happens as you um, as you open up. Mm. So in the last ground, it mentions there that you know he who hears and understands will bear fruit. Yeah. Yeah, and it is, um, <clears throat> some will bear it a hundred times, some will bear, uh, bear it sixty times, uh, and some will bear it ten times. Um, does anyone have an explanation for that? Yeah, I just wondered that when you said it, Stan. I mean, no, it's a good question. Yeah, that, that's parable. It's the same as the parable of the talents. The parable of the talents. Person, person has, each person has so much talent. So yeah, much. yeah. That was. I think the talents were ten, five, and two. Ten, five, and one was something like that. So the numbers were a bit different. But in the context of everything we've studied for the last hour, can we see any light in a hundred times, sixty times, or thirty times? Because Jesus mentions it twice. Um, any thoughts? George, any wisdom? Can you go through the question again, please? Sorry. <laughs> so when you come to the good ground, it says, others fell on good ground and healed it a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, and some thirty. And then Jesus repeats it in verse 23. And it says, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some 60 and some 30. So we're getting this, this, um, these numbers repeated. And I just wondered if, wondered if anyone saw any significance in these numbers. They're all dividable by 10 for a start. <laughs> excellent, <laughs> excellent, excellent. That's, that's the starting point that I took. Yeah. <laughs> George, do you have any, any, any thoughts or have you heard or read anything regarding that? Uh, Johnny took my point. Um, uh, <laughs> my <goodness. laughs> uh, actually, I, I haven't I haven't given it a thought, to be frank with you. But now yeah. that it's great, uh, let me have uh, some people contribute while I <laughs> scratch my, my photo, my photo theological little brain. <laughs> come on, brother, come on. <laughs> right, brother John, run with it. 100 divided by 10 is 10. 60, you're yeah. left with six. 30, you're left with three. So what are you going to do with 10, six, and three? Well, we started the whole theology thing with yes. threes, didn't we? Yes. And I, I thought, it, I, I was going to mention the Mount of Transfiguration, where right. there was three right. disciples went up with Jesus, and then he mm -hmm. met, and then there was Jesus, Moses, and Elijah went into yes. the question. That was another three. So there's six. <laughs> wow, wow. That is such a good manifestation of the chain reaction room in your brain, John. Well, um, perfect. Uh, and then we moved away. It's just as we're about to say something, we moved away to the to right. the sower. So uh, right. I, I, and now you brought up the, the numbers there, and I, I don't know. Yeah, I can't see maybe a correlation. Although it's three, six, and right. It's, so uh, yes, here's what I'm seeing in this. And look, I, I, I don't, obviously in photo theology, you know, sometimes you can't prove things. But um, 100 divided by 10 is 10. 10 is the number that's associated. It's a complete number, but it's associated with the perfect law of God. Right? Oh, right. Yeah. Ten commandments, the law of God. 
60 divided by 10 is six. And as we said earlier, this is the number for man. This is man's number. 30 divided by 10 is three. And that's a number for many things. But one of the things it's the number for is the Trinity. Okay. Yes, yes. So I'm taken back to the places in Revelation because remember, this is now said in the context of the good ground. And remember, I said to you earlier on, the good ground is where the harvest is reaped. So we're talking about the great multitude at the end of time. Yeah. We're talking about bearing fruit 100 times, 60 times, 30 times. So here's this group of people. And Revelation tells me that this group of people are uh, here are those who obey the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus or the testimony of Jesus. So here are they, well, that's six. Here is man who has the commandments of God, that's 10. Man. And the faith of Jesus, well, that's the Godhead. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's how I tied it up, but I don't know. I don't know if there's any other <laughs> excellent excellent so thank you everyone it's been a, a a lovely study with you this afternoon uh yeah brother, thanks very much stan that's you brother, brother you John. Never yeah you're welcome you unmuted so can you pray for us please there's brother john oh okay now you've muted yourself yeah thank yeah you. yeah our heavenly father we just come before you to thank you for the time we've been able to spend together studying your word this afternoon we we thank you for standing all the effort he puts into it and we pray that you would be with each one of us as we go about our daily lives so help us to be to to fall on the good ground lord and and be a witness to you to those around us please for this we ask in your precious name amen amen Amen. Blessings, everyone. And yeah, thank you, Steph. Blessings. Thank you, guys. Have a great week. Bye. Bye. Yeah, Bye. been real good. Thank you. Bye. Bye. God bless. Bye. God bless. God bless. God bless. Yeah. God bless.